And I'm going to give you a background of the Constitution Day. Uh, at one time it was referred to as Citizenship Day, and it is an American federal observance that recognizes the adoption of the United States Constitution and those who have become U.S. citizens. It is normally observed on September 17th, uh, the day in 1787 that delegates to the delegates to the Constitution or Convention signed the document in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The law establishing the present holiday was created in 2004 with the passage of an amendment by Senator Robert Byrd uh, to the Omnibus Spending Bill of 2004. Before this law was enacted, the holiday was known, as I've already said, con a Citizenship Day. In addition to renaming the holiday Constitution Day and Citizenship Day, the Act mandates that all publicly funded educational institutions and all federal agencies provide educational programming on the history of the American Constitution on that day. In May of 2005, uh, it was announced the enactment of this law and it would apply to any school receiving federal funds of any kind. So uh, I do welcome you to ICC or Edelman Community College's Constitution Day celebration. And I now return to this to uh, Chris Stevenson. Chris Stevenson. It's a real privilege and honor to have Senator-elect Chapman Mann on campus today and his lovely wife, Miss Nikki. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick bio on him, and I'm going to let him get up here and do the talking. Uh, Mr. McMahon is married to Miss Nikki Clayton Mahan of Nelton, Mississippi. He is a graduate of Tupelo High School of 1990. Dr. Arnold, that's, yeah. that's your class, isn't it? <laughs> he holds a BS in history from Union University. He's worked in the private sector for 20 years with Great Southern Industries as a director of strategic sales. He currently serves the citizens of Guntown, Mississippi, which is my hometown. So that's kind of how I got a little background on this guy was that my mom and dad live in Guntown. That's where I grew up as a board of aldermen. He was recently elected to the state senate in District 6, which is comprised of North Lee County and Western Itawamba County, which is one of our five county consortium areas. So uh, it's very important to have someone like him here. He is a member of North Star Baptist Church, the Alpha Tau Omega Fraternity, Kiwanis International, and is a sitting member of the, uh, on the Council of Governments. I've had several um, conversations here recently with Mr. May. I, I got to meet him this summer, actually, uh, in physical therapy. He and I were both repairing some uh, wounded limbs. So, you know, you're going through that kind of stuff, as old as we are, you get to this kind of bonding going on there. So I've had some in-depth conversations on the phone, and uh, this is a, we, we're lucky to have a guy like this representing us in the state of Mississippi. And I'm looking forward to turning it over to him and sharing with us what he's going to share with us today. If you don't mind, give a hand for Mr. Chad McMahon. Thank you, Professor. Appreciate that introduction. I want to thank the uh, faculty and staff, Dean Birchfield, for their invitation to be here with you today. I'm excited about being here. Um, good to see my good friend Chuck. We went to high school together. It's true. Um, so, a bunch of good-looking folks in here today. Is everybody here from Mississippi? Anybody from out of state? Couple of guys, Alabama. Where are you guys from? Florida. 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 Yeah, great. Anybody from uh, outside the the republic, outside the country? Okay, good, good. Well, uh, if you'll take out your copies of your constitution, we'll get started. <laughs> what? You don't carry copies of the constitution? Actually, our constitution is the shortest governing document in the world for a modern government. Believe it or not, this is the entire Constitution. It's a pocket size. I actually carry it in my pocket with me pretty regularly. I am not an attorney. I'm just a regular person like many of you in this room. My dad was a carpenter. My mom was a clerk. My wife's father is a carpenter. And, he, and, and her mom was a clerk as well. So I'm just a regular guy, just a blue collar guy. We are going to talk some about the Constitution today, but we're not going to talk about a lot of facts because anybody with a smartphone can look up information on the Constitution. So well, let's talk about the practical application of the Constitution today instead. I want, to get a, I want to get a feel for where you are, so I'm going to ask you some questions about the Constitution, and I'm sure the professors are going to take note of who actually responds to the, to the, to the uh, questions and answers. Uh, who can tell me the difference between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? 
Whoa, anybody? All right, guys, it's pretty basic. There you go. The Declaration of Independence was sent to Britain to say we're declaring ourselves as a, like, as a country, and our Constitution is how we govern ourselves as a country. Perfect. It's a perfect answer. Let's give it up. Where'd you go to high school? Where did you go to high school? Pittsburgh High School. Good for you. Was the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence written at the same time? No, they weren't. They have nothing to do with each other. When you hear people talk about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, don't ever think that they were written at the same time. They were written about 13 years apart. So one has nothing to do with the other. The Declaration of Independence declared, our founding fathers and mothers declared that they were free because their creator had made them free. And they sent that letter to the King of England who was the most powerful man in the world in the 18th century. The Constitution of the United States took those 13 nations, 13 colonies, they were independent states, independent countries, and it bound them in a federal union. Where does our freedom come from? Who wants to answer that question? You as an American, where does your freedom come from? Anybody? It's okay, I mean, there's no wrong answer. Don't be embarrassed. You don't know where your freedom comes from? You're free because of what? Do you think it's the Constitution that gives you your freedom? It's not. The Declaration of Independence, our founding fathers were masters of the English language. And when they declared to England, to the king, they were free because their creator had made them free to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Constitution also confirms that you are free because you are given your freedom by a creator. See, if the Constitution gives you your freedom, your Constitution can take your freedom away. You ever thought about that? No? Nobody has a clue what I'm talking about? Uh, you'll know this one. What about the, uh, what's the difference in a federal and a nationalist government? Anybody know the difference, definition of a federal government and a national government? Okay. I'm just trying to get a feel where we are before we start our little talk. Um, a nationalist government, all power is consolidated in one body. And that body rules or governs the entire country. Okay? And a federal, and a federal, a federal government, which is what our Constitution gave us, you have state governments and you have a federal government that shares power with the states. Some powers belong to the federal government. Some powers belong to the state government. Do you understand that? Okay. The powers that belong to the federal government are listed in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. All right. There's three branches of the federal government. Who can name me one of them? Judicial. Okay, what's the sole power of the judicial? What's different about the judicial than the other two branches? <laughs> it's, um, isn't that where the Congress, like, is right and stuff? The judicial is the, the courts. Yeah, the court. They're supposed to only interpret the law, okay? The courts are only supposed to interpret the law. That is their core power. Every branch has its own core power. Uh, who wants to give me another one? Okay. Man, Vicksburg, there you go. They make the law. They make the law. That's right. That's exactly right. And it's comprised of two houses, House of Representatives and the Senate. What is the core power of the House of Representatives? They have a power that the Senate doesn't have. Do you know what that is? I'm really going to be impressed if you know this. They're the only side of Congress that can, spend, that can generate a spending bill. All, all, all money has to come through the House of Representatives, okay? That's the people's house. That's the people's house. Every day, working folks, that's our representatives. In the Senate side, they also make law. They can't make any law that spends money. It can't generate out of the Senate. But what is a core power of the Senate that the House doesn't have and no other branch of government has? Does anybody know? It's not been used in a very long time. They have the power of impeachment. Not only the president, they can impeach any federal agent. That would be any federal employee as well as the courts, the justices, Supreme Court, all justices. Let's talk about the courts for just a minute. 
the Supreme Court is an equal part of government. Right, Vicksburg? Okay. <laughs> Who established the federal court system? The Constitution established the federal court as far as establishes the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is established by the Constitution. Who established all the other federal courts? This is really important. It's really important. Does anybody know? Do you think the Supreme Court set up all the courts? No. no? Who set them up? Can the federal courts be expanded? Can more judges be added? Yeah. Yeah. Who would do that? Congress does that. Judges outside of the Supreme Court work for the legislature. That's not taught very much in school anymore, but that's an absolute constitutional right. It's in Article 1, Section 3, and again, and again in Article 3 of the Constitution in the judiciary, it also says that judges are subject to Congress. Congress establishes those, those courts. That's a fact. All right, so you got to know a little bit about the Constitution. I just want to try to get some groundwork about where we were before we start our little talk here. So uh, I want everybody to stand up before we start. Stretch, stand up, get your stretch on. All right. Keep your hands to yourself. Don't paint your neighbor or anything. All right, everybody sit down. You see what a good leader I am? You see why I was elected? I'm a leader. Every one of you stood up. We live in an amazing time. We live in the apex of human civilization as far as we know it by written history. It's true. Did you know that you live better than any monarch of the 18th century? What's a monarch? King or queen. King or queen was a monarch. You live, the average American lives better than any king or queen of the, of the 1700s. I'll prove it to you. Look at your cell phone. No king or queen anywhere in the world could have gotten information that quick in the 1700s. As a matter of fact, the King of England would have been the most powerful monarch in the world. The sun never set on the British Empire. Their empire was so vast that no matter where the sun was on the earth, it was shining on a British territory. But yet if the King of England wanted to get some information from India, it would have taken as much as nine months to send an envoy to India for him to return. Yet you can call anybody in India in a moment, and most average Americans can. Not only can you call anybody you want, you can send a video or an email instantaneously. And yet if a, if a king had signed a decree and had sent it to the United States, it would have taken over a year to get here by boat, one way. Well, three, three to four months, and then by the time they got back, it had been a year. So. But think about that. Medicine. In the 1700s, before the 1700s, if a king or queen had gotten strep throat, they were going to die. More than likely, they would have died. Yet what happens if you get strep throat? Jog on down to any pharmacy, get some z pack Take it that night, you're back, you back going tomorrow. Right? So medicine, we live better than a king or queen in the 1700s. Food supply. If a king wanted to have crab legs or sushi, they would have had to plan that meal months in advance. Months in advance. Yet, the average American can go down today, this afternoon when you leave here, you can go get sushi, oranges from Brazil, oranges from Florida, any type of food you want from anywhere in the world at your local grocery store. It's pretty amazing to think about where we are. Look at, look at travel. A king could not have gotten, if he had gotten a carriage, in a golden carriage, the nicest, the nicest thing of the age, of this, of this 18th century, he couldn't have gotten more than what? 100 miles a day? Maybe. In Europe, maybe in a carriage. And he certainly didn't ride in air conditioning. Yet the average American, many of you will do 100 miles a day. It's 60 miles per hour or better. Think about that. That's amazing. No king, the king of England could not have gotten on a ship and gone anywhere in the world in 24 hours. Yet an average American could get on a plane this afternoon 
in an international airport and be anywhere in the world in 24 hours. It's pretty amazing to think about. You live better than a king or queen. Yet, in this nation, why is there so much political discourse? How many people are just happy with where we are in government? Okay. Maybe one. <laughs> oh, he's changed his mind. Oh, he's changed his mind. He's changed his mind. How many of you hear your parents and friends and fellow students talk about, you know, where we are in a nation? You complain. You complain about things going on. Okay. Well, I've got a theory for why this is happening. We have become, in this republic, something that we were never intended to be. In this republic, we were supposed to have a federal system of government where the federal government had certain powers and the states had certain powers. And the states were the people. The Constitution says, Article uh, in the uh, Tenth Amendment, powers not reserved to the federal government belong to the states or the people. The people are the states. Well, what has happened is you've got 537 people in Washington, D.C., roughly. 436 congressmen, roughly, 100 senators, and one president. They're making laws for all of us. We're fighting over Congress. I want you to hear me out on this. All law is being made in one city in the United States, thousands of miles from here, for a nation of 300 million people and we're a continental-sized republic. Do we live the way that they live in California or in Washington State? Do we live like people live in New York City? Do not take me wrong. I'm a, I, I, I'm a, big, I'm a supporter of the union of the federal government. I think that the federal government should do the powers that was enumerated to it in our Constitution. That would be a common defense, an attack on any state would be an attack on, on attack of all the states. If Canada decided to invade Michigan, we should all defend Michigan, okay? I think that we should have a common stable currency. The federal government should give us a common currency. That way when you go to Alabama or Florida, your money's good no matter where you go. And the other thing that they should do well is provide a stable judiciary, a fair judiciary between the states. There are so, so many of our problems are being occurred because we're all fighting over Congress. See, this is not about being a Democrat or being a Republican or a liberal or, or, or a uh, conservative. This is about being an American. And we have the right to self-government. We have a right to self-governments. Our founding fathers fought for that. Our founding mothers fought for that. Take any, like when Republicans have Congress, 40% of the country is unhappy because they're Democrats. And when Democrats have Congress, 40% of the nation is unhappy because they're, because they're Republicans. And we're trying to inflict our will upon each other. We're, we're trying to make a nation, a continental-sized nation of 300 million people fit into the will of 536 people. And I think that's where a lot of our problems coming for, is coming from. Any issue could be resolved at the state level if the federal government would allow the states and the people to have our power, to return power to the people. I'll give you some good examples. In New York, in New York City right now, in New York, the state of New York and the state of Washington, they're thinking about they want to have a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Who wants to make $15 an hour? Many of you, because you're getting a college education, will make much more than that in your lifetime. But, what's that? Not the minimum wage. You, you will. When I, when I was your age, minimum wage was 335. And I make 213. As, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll, share, I'll share a funny story with you. When I, I remember when I was in high school, Chuck will remember this, I, I worked in the snowball stand on uh, Lawndale in Tupelo and I made $5 an hour. My, the owner of the snowball stand paid me $5 an hour. And minimum wage was 335 and gas was 85 cents a gallon. And I thought, man, I am rich. <laughs> I should quit school and just be the snowball king of Tupelo. <laughs> because I'm never going to need any more money than, 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 than $5 an hour. I mean, that was big money, guys, when minimum wage was $3.35. But anyway, 
The states should have the power, and they do have the power, to have minimum wage in, any, in anything they want as long as it's at the federal minimum wage. So let's take New York. Do they have a right to raise minimum wage to $15 an hour in their state? Yeah. Yes. They're going to put it through their legislature. Their governor is going to sign it, and the minimum wage in New York City will be $15 an hour. And I'm fine with that. Aren't you? Huh? Why? Why are you not fine with them making $15 an hour? Huh? Do they have the right, though? That's my question to you. They do. I think they do, too. I think they have the right to... I think they have the right to pay themselves to pay their citizens $15 an hour if they can put it through their legislature. It's not coming through the courts. It's not coming through the governor. The legislature, the representatives of the people, are voting that they want they are, they are want $15 an hour, and they're going to get it. Washington State, the same way. If Mississippi wanted to pay $25 an hour minimum wage, do we have the right as a people? Could we put it through our legislature? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do. I think so too. Don't look at the issue. Don't look at the issue, but look at the mechanism. I'm not asking you to support or not support certain issues. I'm asking you to support the mechanism. Do we have a right to self-governance? Give me any issue. Give me an issue that's important to somebody. What you got, Lemon? What you got? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's controlled by private companies. That's market forces. That's not a policy issue. I know. I know. I feel you though. You, you heard that eighty-five. You, you heard. You heard that eighty-five cents a gallon, didn't you? Give me a policy issue. How about gun uh, control? All right, gun control. I bet if I took a poll in here, there would be some, most of you in here would probably support, well, I wouldn't want to say that, I don't know. If I took a poll, I bet uh, uh, there would be a percentage of you that probably would not support, would, would support gun control. Cl close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. If, if you believe in gun control, raise your hand and nobody better be looking. If you believe in gun control, raise your hand. It's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Know who you are. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Okay, great. If you believe that you ought to be able to own a weapon, a gun, raise your hand. Okay. All right. Put your hand up if you believe, if you don't carry the weight, if you don't think it's an issue either way. Good. I appreciate you being honest, guys. I do. Okay. Open your eyes. There, there was a percentage of people in here that would support gun control. Do you think that Congress should, should, that Congress, a thousand miles away, should be able to take our guns away in Mississippi? No. I don't either. But let me ask you this question. Let's say that Illinois, most of the people of Illinois wanted to take away guns in that state, and they didn't want their citizens, their fellow citizens to have guns. Should, should Illinois have that right? <laughs> Ronald Reagan used to talk about that, voting with your feet. If you weren't happy with it, you could vote with your feet. Now, I know some of the professors in here are thinking, okay, all right, Chad, this is, this is, a, this, this, this is the Second Amendment issue. This is the Second Amendment issue. Okay, look, gun control, has, they can't pass it through Congress. So people who support it have sued different states and organizations, and they've tried, they've tried to make laws against it through the Supreme Court. The problem with that is the Supreme Court is not supposed to make law. They're not elected. And the court has voted on it not once but twice in a five to four decision. They supported the Second Amendment. So let me tell you what that means. Five attorneys gave their opinion and said that gun control was an individual right. Four were in dissent. But if it could have easily been one vote the other way, 
And if five judges had said gun control was legal, that would be the law of the land now. That's what you would say. You would say it's the law of the land, yet no legislative body has voted on it. But that's exactly what's happening in our republic today. What I've given you is exactly what's happening. And I'm not tied up, guys. I, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't have any emotional baggage in the issues. I want you to be sure you understand that. I'm talking about the mechanism, the way we vote, the way the judiciary is supposed to work, the way the executive is supposed to work, and the way the courts are supposed to work. I'm not tied up in the issue. I'm interested in the process. The Supreme Court ruled last month that same-sex marriage was legal in this nation. Nobody voted on that. No legislative body in the entire nation has voted on that. Yet the court has decreed it, has declared it. What if... All right, professors, close your eyes. How many of you in here like to drink beer or drink alcohol every now and then? Okay, I'm the only one, right. <laughs> cool. Yeah. How many of you like to drink? How many of you would drink alcohol when you're of legal age to drink it? How many of you would drink a beer or alcohol? Okay. What if last month the court had said, somebody sued the state of Louisiana and said, hey, we don't want alcohol in the state, of, and we don't want alcohol in, 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 the, in the country. That did happen at one time. There was prohibition in this nation at one time in the republic in the, in the 20s. But what if the Supreme Court last month had said five to four in a decision, hey, alcohol is illegal in the United States now? Would you accept it? Why, why, why would you not accept it? Why would that not be right? Because nobody voted on it, guys. The, court, the court's unelected. <laughs> See, in the 20s when we had prohibition, I don't have a problem with the way that all happened because it went through the legislature. A constitutional amendment was put forward. It passed in Congress. They sent it to the states. And enough states voted to have prohibition in this nation for almost a decade. I have no problem with that because people voted on it. But where my problem would lie today with, is if the court could have could, had done that last month, no one's voted on that issue. The courts just decreed it. And that's exactly what they've done. Is anybody following where I'm going with this? Does it make sense to you? Does it make sense that we have a right to, to self-governance? That, that attorneys who happen to be Supreme Court justices don't have the right to inflict their will on a nation of 300 million people when they've never been elected, they've never been elected to office, but they're making law. And it doesn't make it so just because they say it's so. And again, I'm not, I'm not talking about issues. I'm talking about process. The, this is the way the Constitution is supposed to work. G give me another. Um, look, 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 you know, we, we talked about the same-sex marriage. It's the same thing. If Mississippi voted, and we did vote, that we did not want same-sex marriage in this state, the majority of the people vote, that's the way it should be. But if Washington State or Louisiana, or Tennessee voted through their legislature that they wanted to recognize same-sex marriage, I wouldn't support that, but I'm okay with it because they, they voted on it. The best, the best case for people's rights in the last 10 years is Colorado. Okay? The federal government says that marijuana is illegal. But in Colorado, their people voted through the legislative process that they wanted to legalize marijuana. I do not use drugs. I've never used drugs, okay? I'm not advocating that anyone in this room use drugs. It will destroy you. It will not take you anywhere good. But does Colorado, do the citizens of Colorado have the right to vote in marijuana? Yes. I think they do too. Man, it's a bunch of, man, it's a bunch of constitutionalists in here today, I tell you. How many of you have ever thought about the things that I'm sharing with you today? How many of you, this is the first time you've ever thought about people's rights, our rights? Yeah, me and one other, man. Where are you from? Where'd you go to high school? Nice. 
Okay, now, if we return to a process, if we were to return to a process of people's rights, and each state could decide for itself what we wanted to do, there are going to be some states that are going to lean liberal. But there are going to be some states that are going to lean conservative. There are going to be some states that choose to do something else. We, we don't know what they'll do, but we have, they have the right to choose for themselves what they want to do in a con within, the, within the constitutional fines of, of the state constitution and the federal constitution. And if you're not happy with where you're living and what's going on, you could always move to another state where like-minded people. And that's happening in a lot of states anyway. There's a great sort taking place in the republic anyway. But there's nowhere to flee. Um, so anyway, I think, I think everybody pretty much has got the point of that. Um, I want you to be optimistic about the future. I, I'm excited about the opportunities in this country and what I see taking place. We stand on the, guys, we're right on the edge of a technological revolution. Everything that we do in the future will be different from what we've done in the past. The way we work, the way we study, it's, it's going to be so different. With smartphones now, I mean, you, work, you can be at work anywhere. You can be sitting on the beach doing your work now. Our best days are ahead of us. They really are. We don't know what type of vehicles, airplanes. Hey, it was only 100 years ago that the airplane was invented. And since the airplane's been invented, we've been to the moon. <laughs> you don't believe that? <laughs> okay, one person doesn't think we've been to the moon. See me after class. I know you did. Do you know that when we went to the moon, the handheld calculator didn't exist? How many of you knew that? When we went to the moon, there was no handheld calculator. When we went to the moon, your cell phone has more computing power than the uh, lunar lander had when it, when it landed on the moon. It's pretty amazing. We're on the edge of a technological explosion. And I'm really excited about what I see, but we need to get we need to get our, our house in order politically. We need people to know who they are and return power to the people. All right, I'm going to take a couple of questions. Anybody got any questions about what we've talked about? It may or may not be what you... Yes, sir? How do you propose that happen? Just having a conversation about it. We have to start somewhere. There are very few people talking about this. Very few people talking about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in a lot of political circles, when I mention it, they're saying, well, Chad, you know, like, uh, they'll say, well, this, let, let's talk about what happened last month with, with same-sex marriage. And again, I want you to understand, I'm, I'm not tied to the issue. I'm tied to the process. The Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriage was legal. And, and I hear politicians, they're like, well, it's the law of the land now, Chad. It's the law of the land. I'm like... What do you mean it's the law of the land? Laws can be changed. What are you talking about? It's not the law of the land. That was the opinion of five attorneys who happened to be Supreme Court justices. What do you mean it's the law of the land? It's not the law of the land. Nobody voted on that. Nobody voted on it. That's my problem with the what that's my problem with the whole with the whole process. Nobody voted on that. The federal government's picking and choosing what they want to enforce. They're going to let Colorado have marijuana, but yet they're going to inflict their will across everybody. And look, this Constitution doesn't give, doesn't give the federal government the right to declare what marriage is. Marriage is a 7,000-year-old definition of marriage between a man and a woman. And just, because nine, just because five attorneys in, in uh, Washington, D.C. say that it can be anybody doesn't make it right. Does it? I don't think it makes it right. If they can tell you that, they can tell you anything. Coming for you, if they rule in a 5-4 decision for gun control, that would be child's play compared to what they've, what they've already done to you. Anybody else? Another issue? Decision? Yeah, Vicksburg.
how can you learn to vote in law if you can't even vote the guy who, like... You do vote for the president. The Electoral College is there to protect us. You, you don't think it's there to protect you, but it is. Did you know that without the Electoral College, we have 50 states in this, in this republic, right? Did you know without the Electoral College that if the eight largest states got together and wanted to pick the president, eight state, eight. <laughs> <laughs> Math made easy, I can count. <laughs> eight states could pick the president. What are the other 42 states supposed to do? Is that majority? It's there to protect you. You're being told something that's not true. The Constitution sets up the Electoral College intentionally so that the small states like Mississippi are protected from the big states, the large populations. But think about this, a president, it could be a Democrat, could be a Republican, could be anybody. I'm not, a president, a person, a man or woman running for president could run a campaign, without the Electoral College, could run a campaign in eight states and never go to the other 42 and be president. That, that doesn't, that's not, to me, that doesn't represent the majority of the people of this nation. Does that make sense to you? I mean, you can argue with me. Hey, I mean, this is a time, guys, for, this is a time for you to express yourself, to, to, to tell me, I mean, say what you think. Even if you take away the Electoral College, can you go back to history and count all the registered votes that have been put in and only change one election in history throughout all the presidents that we've had? Do you remember which one that was? No, I don't know. I don't remember exactly which yeah. one was. I just knew it changed it. So it's there to protect the small, it's really there to protect the small states. It really is, and it's a fair process. Doesn't it take the account of, it takes however many, like say that a state votes 55% Republican, or the 45 Democratic, and all of the electoral votes since the Republican won in that state, all the Republican, it gets all the Republican votes for that state. That's correct. But they're not bound by law. You know, they're not bound to vote that way. Like Mississippi has six electoral votes. And when our, let's say that uh, a Democrat won this state, but when they get to the college, they could vote the other way if they wanted to, but they wouldn't. You, you wouldn't do that. But the, they could. They could. It's public knowledge if they do, though. It is public knowledge. That's right. It is public knowledge if they do. Right. Oh, no, no, no. It's not secret. No. The electoral college is not secret. Mm -mm. Any other questions about the Constitution? How do you propose that uh, we reinstate the uh, powers of the checks and balance system in the government? Those powers are going to have to be used. They're going to have to be utilized to restore it. Do you think that we have to start back with the people controlling the checks and balances on the three branches of federal government to be able to restore back to where they were? The people do control the checks and balances at every election. At every election. At every election, you control it. Uh, the Supreme Court could not be making these crazy rulings if the Senate were to use their constitutional authority and impeach those judges. That's the check. I'm not advocating that they do that. I'm telling you that's the check on the judiciary. Federal courts cannot operate outside of the jurisdiction of the Congress, and the Senate, could, can, the Senate can actually impeach those, those federal judges. The Supreme Court judges as well, they're not for life. And it's just the fact that they're not using It's not been used in a very long time. There have been Supreme Court justices impeached, but not in a very long time. What you got, my man? Oh, uh, like you said, there's five people that, like, elected, or that said the gay marriage is okay. Why doesn't Mississippi just say, like, no, I don't want to do that. They don't have a constitutional right over all the states. So that's like, why don't we just get in and say, okay, that's a, that's a great question. Last week there was a clerk, a city clerk in a county in Kentucky that said she wouldn't do it. And, they, and a federal judge arrested her. Put her in jail for a week. I don't believe they have the constitutional authority to do that because no law had been broken. Think about this. A federal judge arrested an elected official in a state and, that's, and that county clerk had broken no law. It's a violation of state law. It's a violation of Kentucky state law for same-sex marriage. She was upholding state law, but a federal judge had her arrested. She broke no law. 
That makes sense. How did, the, how did that happen? Well, there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons that's happened. Congress could have stepped in and told that federal judge, you don't have the jurisdiction. They could have done that. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. You can read the Constitution. It's, it's in there. It's not in there once. It's in there twice about who establishes the courts and, and what the court's responsibility is to the legislature. I Vicksburg. Do you want to come up and talk? I'm cool with it. Right. It wasn't voted. It was just the the courts deemed that it was okay to be voted on. Federal law. In the case you're talking about in the Civil War, the states were violating the civil rights of many people that should have been free, and the federal government, under the federal constitution, stepped in and made those citizens free. That's an ugly stain on our history. It's been corrected, and I'm glad it's been corrected. But that's what happened. And what's the difference between those people being physically slaves and us enslaving people morally by telling them that they can't be made to the same sex? Because the majority of the people hadn't voted on that. That's not a civil rights issue. How's it not a civil rights issue? It's a decency issue. What do you mean? It's a decency issue. Do, do, do you understand? Do you have to have, how many of you in here believe there's, that you have no morality in law? All law is built on morality. It's a decency issue. It's a morality issue. Also, there's lots of medical evidence that shows it's a very unhealthy lifestyle. Smoking's unhealthy, too. No doubt about it. <laughs> no doubt about it. There, therein lies the dilemma. I'm going to take one more question. What you got? I got a question. Question, question, question. Listen, I can't do anything about the gas, okay? <laughs> if, you want, if you want a 50 cent menu at Taco Bell, we can't do anything about that either. I want to know why they just won't legalize marijuana so they can take it and go back to All right, say that again. Yeah. Legalize marijuana, impose a national tax over that single thing, and then use that money to start paying that. You can. Tax. You can. If you go to Texas and you put it on the ballot, and the majority of the people vote for that, then then it would be legal in Texas. In Mississippi, there is a petition. There is a petition that's being circulated to be signed to legalize marijuana in the state. There is. And I will not, I will not, when I go to the vote, if, I, if it's ever on the poll, if it's ever on the ballot and I go to vote for it, I will not vote for it. Because, because, because it will not make us a better society, folks. It'll make us not be slaves to China and Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Which the Chinese thing is kind of overdone. Everybody says that China's going to attack us and stuff like that, but if China did attack us, their economy would crumble because we're the main source of their economy. That, you guys are, hey, this is Constitution. Wait a minute, let's talk about This is Constitution. I'm talking about the Constitution. <laughs> if anybody wants to attack this great republic, they're going to find there's a lot of liberty-minded men and women who are ready to defend this nation. Are you, are you ready to defend this nation? If it has to be defended? Yeah, me too. Me too. So if Mississippi, like, we, we can vote anything in that we want. As long as it doesn't violate the federal, the, the Bill of Rights. So there's no one that tells us that we can't. We just have to do it. You just have to, you have to put a, if you wanted to say that everybody in Mississippi had to drive a GMC truck and you could put, to, put it on the ballot and enough people could vote for it, I suppose that would be the law. <laughs> 
You want to forward? No. Okay, anybody else? Uh, anybody else got a comment about something that has to do with the Constitution? Did, did, was this helpful? Did, 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 oh, did, any, did anybody, raise your hand if anybody had their eyes opened about anything about the practical application of the Constitution? That's all, look, that's all I wanted you to do, guys, was think about this. Look, thousands of men and women died to give us this. And they're still dying for it, to protect it. Freedom and liberty is only one generation deep. My generation's defending it. It will be your generation's turn to defend this Constitution and your freedom and liberty. And are you going to be prepared to do it? When our founding fathers went to war with King George, he was the most powerful man in the world. And when they, when they said, we want to be free, they stood at Bunker Hill with the most powerful army in the world. And, and they thought everything was lost at Saratoga. We thought we had lost a republic. Before we'd ever been born, we thought we'd lost everything. And when we finally forged our freedom, we forged our freedom in blood and iron and sweat and death and life at Yorktown and defeated the British, do you think those men and women were looking at each other saying, boy, I hope we can defeat this one king so we can set ourselves up a bunch of kings in Washington, D.C. that we'll call Supreme Court justices? I don't think that's what freedom's all about. But I'm glad so many of you here today had your eyes open. Did you... Feel good about it? All right. All right, I'll be around a few minutes afterwards. You can find me on Facebook, McMahon from Mississippi, um, or, or, or Chad McMahon. So I want to invite you to come down and see me at the uh, State Senate sometime. I also want to invite you, extend the invitation to you if you ever would like to see how city government works. You can go down to your city council. Uh, Guntown, Mississippi is a code government formed after the Civil War. We are a code municipality. We meet the first Tuesday of every month at 5 o'clock. You can go to your city council meeting and you can address the board and say anything you want to say and, and your name and what you said will be placed in the minutes and forever will be in the minutes forever. So I want to encourage you, man, get involved. Whatever you believe, get involved. Okay? It's your, it's your republic. It's your constitution. And what you do with it is up to you. Thank you so much. Senator, we, we thank you for coming here. You challenged people with, with the questions, things that were opened up. Thank you, wife, for coming. Uh, you are the future of this country. You are the future. You're the next leaders. Uh, and so that's the challenge he's throwing out there to you. And we appreciate your time. And uh, this will conclude the Constitution Day program. Thank you.